my edge on things is probably a bit more sci-fi than actual science, so bear with me as I show you some weird things. Um, so I do have an ice project I'm going to go into. I'm going to save it for last. Um, since I do do this sort of like wide variety of things, and I assume nobody really knows what I do, um, I figured I would just like show you some things first. So this is, uh, this is a piece called For Hugging instead of For Punching, but it's for, it's for hugging. And um, so a lot of the materials I use um, are generally things that are close to me, things that it's very rare that I'll go out and buy a material to make art with. I usually just sort of have things that are around me. So in this case, this was a punching bag that I bought to punch. And then I put a pair of my pants on it um, and uh, a belt and shoes, which is actually the same belt and shoes that I'm wearing. <laughs> um, I had to take it off the sculpture to come here. Um, <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we'll just, we'll just move on from there. <laughs> Do we have audio for sure? Hopefully. I'm going to play this. This is a sculpture that I made uh, a couple years ago. And yeah, it's definitely okay to laugh. A lot of what I do has to do with finding humor and sometimes unhumorous scenarios. This is shown a couple of times, and it's, it's actually a real hot dog and a real bun. Uh, so by the end of the show, you know, like a month or so, they look pretty funky. Um, <laughs> the, the hot dog gets really moldy, kind of ends up getting stuck in the corner and doesn't really move anymore. So they, they kind of suffer from old age at a certain point, and the chase slows down, you know. And of course, they never, they never come together. And I, I kind of was talking over the microwave ding that says that it's over. So. All right, so there's one thing. And then maybe this will make you laugh too, I don't know. But this is called Toast Sex. And again, two real pieces of toast. And it's just whatever is on, it's a, the classical radio station is always playing behind it. So whatever's on sort of dictates the mood of the intercourse. And then to, just to give you an example of uh, another song. Okay, it's good. <laughs> Uh, this thing, this thing never started, so I hope someone's keeping tabs on how fast or what my time is. Um, so this is a piece called Knotted Noodle, um, and this is just sort of, I, I thought this would be good to show, just to show that really in a lot of ways I'm just interested in what things are. Um, I'm not terribly interested in what things mean. I think that they can mean things, um, but I think it starts with a sort of feeling that's just in something. Um, and in this case, I just kind of found that in just doing an action where I cooked a spaghetti noodle, tied it in a knot, dried it, and uh, put it in this plinth pedestal sort of scenario. It's a little less funny than the other things. I think it's funny. <laughs> Actually, I had this in a show at one point, and I, it was the only thing in the room was this pedestal with this noodle, and I overheard somebody say, only thing in here, eh? Must be important. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Um, maybe more serious here, I guess, but this is a project I did where I, uh, I took a video of a mountainscape, um, and basically I had a camera, I held it in my hands, and I zoomed in as far as I could on it, and then all I, I just tried to hold my hands as steady as I could um, on the mountainscape, and of course, so it's shaking all over the place, um, because I kind of shake anyways, but, you know, just whenever you try to hold anything steady. And then inside of this uh, sort of cracked up vitrine thing here is um, uh, a clay sort of wad with a bed sheet inside of it. And really what I was kind of going for here is this sort of bodily sensation of being with a mountain and kind of thinking about 
the relationship between a sort of interior in myself and the interior of the mountain, the kind of gravity of the mountain and the gravity in me. Um, and then kind of equating that to, yeah, I guess, just kind of like a, an inner outer sort of subconscious scenario that's integrated into the planet itself um, in my body. Like the reason that I'm nervous right now, even though I can say like, I don't give a shit about any of this, you know, like, but I still freak out because I'm human, you know, and, and it's, and, you know, these chemicals are running through my thing, through my brain and I can't really have a lot of control over it much like, you know, we can try and control our environment, but we don't really know how to do that. Um, we try, but anyways, uh, this is a piece I did called dream body. Um, so it's actually a sort of positive voodoo doll for myself. So I do these kinds of different things to him, uh, you know, in, at different times. Uh, at this point, he's got a, uh, a camera in his genitals to look out instead of at. Um, he's got a rubber chicken as a pet uh, that's sort of been made to stand. Um, he's got uh, past life uh, hypnosis tracks playing into his body. And he actually has a sort of breathing mechanism that's sound activated. So whenever that's playing, he's sort of sitting there and breathing. And so the kind of idea behind this guy um, is that he's, he is uh, my sort of, again, like a sort of object that is my body. So I do things to it to try and make myself uh, feel better in whatever scenario I'm sort of in. And so one of the interesting things about him is that he is for sale, but he's also, um, you can only buy parts of him. Uh, I own 51% of him at all times. So, so if you want to own him, you only own a part. Um, and then, of course, when I die, all of that gets you know, broken up, however, I don't really care. Um, but uh, so that's his life. No one's bought any part of him yet, so if anyone's interested, let me know. Um, so, you know, again, I'm just kind of showing you some various things. Uh, this is, uh, I do a lot of collaborations as well. Um, these two guys here are my studio mates in Dallas, uh, Gregory Rupp on the right there and Danny Skinner in the middle. Um, so we're all, you know, we're all, we do lots of different things. Um, we're working on a movie right now. We make music. Um, there's, there's lots of stuff that goes on uh, between all of us and, and individuals. We're, they're individual artists as well. Um, this is just uh, this is the dinner, fancy dinner party that JD mentioned, where we actually played a, uh, a fancy dinner party that was giving an award to Pierre Huig, um, who's a sculptor you guys may have heard of probably. Um, but we kind of created this ring in order to sit inside um, uh, to sort of protect us from everything, and we just got drunk on mezcal and sat in there and played music the whole time and kind of separated ourselves from the scenario and ended up hearing later that people really liked it, so that was nice. We went into it kind of not caring or at least telling ourselves that. Um, and then this is another project we did where we made these sort of hydroacoustical instruments. Um, and uh, so there's actually the hydrophones, uh, uh, microphones that go in the water that are picking up sounds and it's sort of reverberating through the tank. And so we do these musical performances as, as well, which is what we're doing at the Nasher, um, kind of. It's a little different. Um, I won't go into it though, because I've, I don't know. Does anyone know what, how long have I been speaking for? Seven minutes? Okay, thanks. Um, and so I also run a space called Culture Hole in Dallas. If anybody's ever in Dallas, maybe keep an eye out for an event. We actually only have them very rarely. They're one night. They're from 10 to midnight. We kind of wanted to do this thing that feels a bit outside of the sort of general circumstance that happens with an exhibition. So we found this, this hole inside of another building, which is actually the power station in Dallas, which is, uh, I've, I've had a show there before, and it's... Um, this really big, uh, sort of beautiful brick building that uh, used to be a power and light building. And so we do various shows in here. Um, this is just, you know, this guy had some books and I won't go into, you know, everything that they're doing. This guy was trying to have an orgasm without touching himself, which is a very interesting show. Um, here's Greg down in the hole trying, or we uh, made it into a tiny gallery at one point. Um, and then we invited an artist to sort of interact with it. So it's not just a space in itself. It's actually the sort of psychological space that we mess with and play with. And, invite people to sort of interact with. Um, so the ice work. Um, <clears throat> so my dad um, is an HVAC technician and I've worked for him or did work for him on and off. I mean, you know, as early as eight years old, I was carrying his tool bag and holding a light on things for him while he was uh, servicing heaters at that point because we were in Detroit. So it was kind of rare that we would work on other things, but, you know, freezers and all, all these kinds of things. And, 
And so, you know, he's owned his own company for uh, something like 30 years now. Um, and, you know, I'm 35 or something, 36. I'm going to be in a couple days, actually. Um, so basically, this project is sort of a way of me collaborating with my dad. Um, this piece is called Dad. Um, this is called Dad 2, or this is, you know, Dad 3. There's all these different pieces that I'm making, and, and he's actually the one building them, which is kind of a lovely thing, I think. Um, I, uh, you know, I kind of get in touch with him and say, like, hey, man, you want to make another one of these things? And he's always like, Ugh, I don't know. <laughs> And, um, I, you know, I, I talk them into it, and, but, you know, of course they're getting bigger and bigger, so it's getting to this point where it's like, okay, it's time to, like, pass the torch on to the sun, and now I start to make the machines, or at least, you know, make enough money doing what I'm doing to pay people to make the machines. Uh, we'll see what happens. But, of course, the goal is to sort of, you know, get these things uh, to take on these sort of various forms. But anyways, the point being is that I, I think I have more of a familial attachment to ice um, in the sense that I've sort of been around it my whole life uh, through the context of my dad. Um, and the thing that actually spawned me to want to make these ice works um, isn't just my dad. It's um, a job that we went on when I was younger. I guess I was probably, I guess I was 17 or something like that. I had actually dropped out of high school at the time and was working with my dad um, to make money. And uh, we ended up going to this house, and um, the house was uh, no longer lived in anymore. There was an old man who was living there. I got very little information. The information I got was that an old man had lived there, and his wife had died 10 years prior. Um, there was no heat in the house, so we were going there to get the heat on so that they could fix the house up and make it for sale. Um, so when I when we got to the house, uh, the first thing that we both noticed is that there was a uh, about an eight foot hole in the roof of the house, so this massive gaping hole. And uh, when we went inside um, in the living room, there was a it was a two story house. So in the living room, there was a hole in the ceiling, and then a hole through the second floor all the way up through the through the roof, so you could stand down there and watch the sky going by this hole. And then on the ground in the living room, right in the middle of the living room, was a uh, kiddie pool. Thank you. It was a kiddie pool um, full of ice. And, um, and so this was this very momentous thing for me in some ways, uh, seeing this ice block um, in a living room um, under the context of something that had sort of happened to this old man. Uh, this old man had, you know, apparently, and of course I'm just stitching this, these things together with my own imagination, but um, you know, had lived his whole life, and then apparently let the house go for those ten years that his wife had died, and uh, and I couldn't help but attach myself to this man. All these years are going by, and I still think about it regularly to the point of. Um, and sorry, this is this piece growing. It, it gathers humidity from the air, and they get larger and larger. So this is what it looks like as it's growing. Um, so because I've only got like thirty seconds left, or I'm probably already over time. Um, I'll just kind of finish by saying that all of this sort of wraps up into this project that I'm working on now, which is a book, um, a fictional book, sort of sci-fi book, about an artist who makes ice sculptures um, and invents a machine that creates icebergs uh, in the ocean in order to sort of reverse climate change. And then he's invited to come to Washington, D.C. to give a talk at a science conference. <laughs> And inevitably, uh, the machine ends up getting made. Um, the book goes very far into the future and talks about how the actual planet is destroyed because of the creation of these machines that this artist has made. Um, and then there's also this sort of backtracking in the book going into the past and talking about the life of this man whose house I walked into. And so the point of the story is sort of connecting this sort of object of this ice block that this old man left um, to the inevitable invention for something to fix something which inevitably destroys the earth. Um, and so point being, I guess, is uh, I guess I'm just sort of interested in those kinds of connections between things, um, things that are highly personal that amplify out into being um, kind of the entirety of everything. Thanks.